He also started working at Google just three years after it went public from 2007 to 2021. And I'd love it if you'd share how you joined Google and what it was like for Google in the early 2000s. Are there any stories or experiences that stand out? Uh, sure and yes. <laughs> uh, so I was teaching for a few years um, and I got a call one day from Google. I got an email one day from Google said, did I want to come interview? And my initial reaction internally was, no, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm teaching, I'm a professor, I don't need to do this. And that was just randomly, just uh, random email. Yeah, I don't know where it came from, so unsolicited, yeah. Um, and so I ended up doing the interview initially because I thought, well, you know, you can learn a lot from an interview itself. And so why don't I just go have that interview and I can bring that back into the classroom. And so I had the interview. It was really, really interesting. Um, we proceeded to talk. And after, you know, after a couple of months, it turned into an offer. And so I ended up accepting that and taking personal leave from teaching. And then I did it a couple of times. And then eventually I just decided to stay there. Yeah. And I stayed there almost 15 years. Yeah. Were you pretty familiar with Google and their business before interviewing with them? Um, yeah, I mean, as an outsider, certainly. Yeah, as an outsider. You know, the, the culture was, was, was famous. You know, search was a big deal, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, I'm reflecting on that transition from being an outsider to an insider at Google. What were some of the things that surprised you about the way Google runs, at least back then in the early 2000s? Um, well, this isn't it. Let me answer that second. The first thing, just by being an insider and an insider, I remember the day I went for my interview, just going to the reception desk and just being blown away that I was in the lobby of Google. It was a pretty exciting place to be. I mean, like the first year I worked there, even though it was really hard, it was hard sometimes to wipe the smile off my face. I'm just like, I'm in, I'm in this place. This is really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the second part of your question? Um, and maybe how that evolved over time. Yeah. Uh, so I, I stayed at Google almost 15 years. I still think it's, you know, it's a terrific place. It, it's different. It's gotten to be a much, much bigger company. Um, I think the most interesting work that I did there, just, I guess, relates to the, the, some of the stories. I, I had, over the, those years, I probably had five distinct jobs in different parts of the organization. Uh, two that stand out, one was, um, I initially got involved in their data center, what's called data center site selection, which is where do they want to put these big warehouses full of computers? And so I was part of a small team to figure out where do they want to build their new data centers in Southeast Asia. And so um, there was a strategic negotiator in myself and, and one other fellow who spent a lot of time over about two years going back and forth into Asia and, and talking to different countries and, and governments and economic development organizations to figure out where, where would Google invest. Um, that was fascinating because it was international, it was Southeast Asia, but, but even like these data center decisions are just so multidisciplinary. I mean, there's all kinds of engineering fields, there's finance, there's negotiations, there's operations. Um, just the multidisciplinary aspect of that in that context was, was really, really fun and interesting. Yeah. Could you walk us through maybe one of the negotiations of a data center that you built in, in the Asia region? Sure. So, so they ended up building data centers in, in Taiwan and Singapore um, mm -hmm. that, that are there today in, in Massive. Um, and so in, in Taiwan, for example, we were out in these, these open fields with these really, really high uh, wind turbines that were nearby, and we were just you know, we'd meet with, with tax people, we'd, we'd meet with economic development people, you'd meet with you know, power authorities, et cetera. And, and so talking with them and, and negotiating with them and then bringing that back and kind of uh, bridging that culture with Google's culture was always kind of interesting because, you know, both sides came from different perspectives and we were in the middle trying to make these deals happen. You know, inside Google trying to convince people that, that this is a good deal because, you know, here are the facts and here's what we think. And on the outside, this is, you know, why I think we think it's a good deal, you know, for you to allow Google to come in and do this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And they were very confidential as well, because there was a lot of other companies that were trying to do similar things, and they would sort of look over each other's shoulders to try to, you know, get an edge naturally. Um, so that, that aspect was, was quite interesting as well. Any stories stand out from those international trips? Uh, I, nothing comes to mind that I, I can really share in a podcast, yeah. For sure. Um, you also worked on uh, YouTube for a bit uh, yeah. as a technical program manager. Could yeah. you break down sort of the differences between a technical program manager, a program manager, product manager? Oh, sure, yeah. Um, so a in an engineering organization, there's several roles that stand out. I mean, there are leaders and managers, of course. Uh, there are the engineers that like built right software. There are product managers that, these are all op oversimplifications and there's a lot mm -hmm. of overlap. But um, product managers that basically translate business requirements into product requirements, and they figure out what should we build in light of what the business wants. Um, and there are technical program managers that largely focus on 
okay, we, we have these goals, we have these engineering resources, how do we organize these, marshal these resources to deliver this thing? And then drive that execution. But in reality, it's like, you know, you can think of three circles that overlap. It's like a Venn diagram of engineers and product managers and, and technical program managers. And, you know, a lot of technical program managers were computer scientists before. They don't write code typically, but they understand that. You know, engineers can certainly, um, un can, can and should in many cases understand business requirements. But those three, product manager, technical program manager, and engineers, quite often partner um, on delivering big complex, you know, software programs. Um, the difference between technical program manager and program manager typically is the, the technical part. And so a, a program manager will have a program and, and, you know, define goals, figure out how to get resources together, you know, how to push the execution, how to communicate with people, you know, how to identify blocks, unblock, et cetera. Adding the technical part just means, you know, someone that exercises technical judgment and can partner with engineers to, you know, have an informed opinion and help influence the technical direction, you know, whether it's, it's upfront in design or it's, it's um, you know, in unblocking or dealing with situations. So that's the difference between program manager and technical program manager. Uh, product manager, yeah, like I said, is more about around the requirements and such. Yeah, and what were some of the, the programs you'd manage technically at YouTube during your time there? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking of two of them earlier. Um, one was a spectacular success, and one was a spectacular failure. And so, um, so I worked in YouTube data engineering, which owned the infrastructure for um, managing data and building and maintaining it like a data warehouse and the source of all the analytics for the business, you know, whether it's internal or outside, et cetera, um, as well as they owned the warehouse. And so they spent an enormous amount of money on, on compute resources. And so there was some internal budgeting process and the rate of growth had exceeded what people were comfortable with. And so there was a, a program to, you know, essentially bend the curve uh, of the cost, the, the growth of the cost. You know, we were going to spend, you know, X, we were projected to spend X next year. We should spend, you know, like 80% of X, something like that. And that's just on compute, the, the money yeah, you're spending? Yeah, compute, yeah. Okay. It was compute, um, storage, you know, network, et cetera. But, you know, related to computing, it's, it's right. It's not about people and such. This mm -hmm. budget wasn't about people. And so this technical program was digging into the analytics to understand where are we spending and then partnering and collaborating with the engineering teams of, um, you know, with this awareness, how do we, how do we manage that? You know, there are some particular programs to, to drive down costs. Other times it was a matter of just keeping an eye on things, responding to things quickly. And so that was very successful. We really did in a, in a big way, you know, bend the curve there. Um, so that was very successful. The, the other one that wasn't was a number of years before that. Um, there was a big program to set up like, almost engineering-wide um, integration testing. And what that means is different teams have different, own different systems and to find some way to do more integrated testing of, you know, when, when this A is connected to B, connected to C, connected to D, you know, when all together, you know, are they operating as, as expected? Can you, can you run test data through it? Can you kind of monitor what's coming, going in and coming out to be sure it's valid? There's right. lots of tests already, but... Is that sort of like proofreading code before it, it goes... No, that's, that's a different kind of testing. Live. This okay. is more like when the systems are working, when they're all in integration, is there a more comprehensive way in a test environment to be sure it's, it's operating as, as expected? Okay. Um, there's lots of levels of testing. This was intended to be like this umbrella over, over all of the other. And the re there was a great idea. It was just very complex. And the complexity was... Well, the incentives were no match for the complexity, meaning... Mm -hmm. It was hard to get, it's simple enough to get teams to do the right thing to actually make this feasible and operate it. So at some point after a couple of years, we just abandoned effort. Did that teach you sort of something about uh, simplicity about problem solving and, and maybe sometimes when, um, maybe something about how the most simplest solutions are, are typically the most optimal versus over complex Yeah, things. I mean, there is, for testing, there's many, many layers. I mean, anyone in the audience knows about testing, right? There's many layers. You know, at the bottom is a like unit testing. At the top is different kinds of integration testing. And so there's a lot more that could be done. Um, oh, could you explain a little bit of that? I haven't heard of. Sure. So unit testing is like particular units, units of code that you can validate. Are they doing the right thing? You feed this in, does the right thing come out? And okay. then you could, as you combine bigger and bigger, the scope of those tests, you know, is it behaving as you want? Integration testing is, is just like... In, in YouTube and in, in the data that they take to monitor the systems as well as run the systems, um, it just, it's the broadest view of if you integrate all of these systems or all of the relevant systems in the, like the critical path. Um, that's, that's much more complex to do, and so there was a lot more robust testing you could do, you know, kind of in the middle. 
Okay, cool. They're, they're great books I can point you guys to. For sure. Testing. 